so our um, next and final presenter of the evening is Sari Yan. So she wrote a chapter in More Ice and Crime, The Rhetoric of Mediated Matches. Uh, she will soon yet go and be with you again as well presenting this, but I will quickly introduce her. So Sarah is a Maurice Kodowska career leading fellow postdoc at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Uh, she researches surveillance, technical communication, information and rhetoric, especially in the law enforcement and investigation context. Uh, she previously worked as a lecturer at the School of Information at the University of Arizona and has spent over 11 years contracted as an investigator for the U.S. government. Sarah will also be starting quite a new project dealing with surveillance and the security of quantum networks. So, um, Sarah, I think you're also right there. Sorry, I have like small images of all of you, so I just want to make sure. So, yeah, if you are there, it's all yours. Thank you. Yeah, I can see you now. Good. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here with everyone. Um, kind of like everyone has said, I, I do, um, I'm excited to, to be able to talk about this chapter. Um, so I'll just kind of give you a brief overview of what the chapter um, was or in the conclusions I kind of came to and what led me to those conclusions tonight. So um, the idea is yes, more eyes on crime, the rhetoric of mediated mugshots. Um, and it's based on uh, the uh, Maricopa County Sheriff's Office uh, uh, former site of uh, the, the mugshot of the day. Um, and here's kind of like a sketch. I didn't want to um, be too open about what it actually looked like and, and further um, address the, the, the individuals that were in, in the photos. But um, you can see that uh, at the top, they, they have a picture of the sheriff. Um, and then in the middle kind of area, there's uh, the, the winner, so to speak, of the mugshot of the day. Um, and then you can kind of search uh, through different crimes. Um, and then there's the, the other like runners up of the day. Um, so basically this idea is that the sheriff's office posts uh, mug shots of anyone that's got, uh, has been arrested um, and leaves them up on the site for three days. This ran from 2011 to 2015. So um, the, the or 16, I think. Uh, the current site still has the mugshots, but it's not a game, so to speak, where you can vote on, on individuals that have been arrested. So um, that's the, uh, the site. Um, and basically, the, the Sheriff Joe is the, the individual that kind of made this uh, program. He wanted to tout himself as kind of the uh, America's toughest sheriff. Um, and he ha also had a, a lot of other pro programs in the mid uh, 2010s where he uh, made people that were arrested uh, live in tents in, in the desert. Uh, it's in Phoenix, Arizona, which is a, a desert city. Um, had these chain gangs. He boasted of like a 10 cent bologna sandwich uh, to, to feed the, the, um, the, the people that were in jail, made them wear pink underwear. Um, as if that was something bad, uh, had these jail cams where they would uh, kind of do a cam of people getting arrested or booked in, into the, the, the jail. So, um, so it was part, it's part of this larger phenomenon of posting social or uh, mugshots onto social media pages, but Seraph Joe kind of um, uh, used it as something that to show how tough he was. Um, and he justified the posting and then the contest to, to see um, uh, whose mugshot would, I guess, rise to the top under the guise of, you know, more eye, eyes on arrestees may result in more leads to, to criminal investigators. So, um, but, you know, I wondered, is this really what's going on here? You know, what is the rhetoric of this uh, <laughs> the site? What are we, are we encouraged to do to, to identify more criminals? Um, and to do that, it was kind of hard because I, it's an anonymous site where you can't tell, you know, go back and ask who, why did you vote and, and why, or what, why are you interacting with the site? Um, so I tried to do kind of an object and views analysis of the website where I looked at the function, like what is the site allowing you to do and, and kind of what is it, what actions is it encouraging? Um, I, you would think that if it was encouraging uh, more eyes on crime, it might expect the site would help evaluate crime in some way or like facilitate some um, reporting procedure. Um, and then I look also looked at an assessment of the photo sample. So not only kind of like what was the site encouraging to do, but who are the people that were being um, picked? You know, you might expect those featured might represent a larger threat to society or something like that if you were trying to look at more um, uh, leads for criminal investigators. Um, so my overall argument that was, uh, you know, supporters claim that uh, mugshots online is uh, helps 
show tr more transparency of the, the agency and provides more information for community. Um, but is, is that the rhetoric that's being extolled through these sites? And then my argument is by looking at the, the program, I argue that um, through this exigies, exigency of entertainment on these uh, through participation, mugshots kind of called into being a group of digital entities and, and weapon that were, that were weaponizing visibility. So um, the, the way that I came to that again is I did the summary of the site and then I looked at the people that were um, being chosen. Um, so the, the, the site, there was ways that you could, you know, kind of look at different crimes, but essentially um, you couldn't interact really with those. It's not like you could report somebody or see that. So, so in general, um, it wasn't designed to facilitate crime. It's kind of, it was made for kind of like an entertainment voting kind of system. And then the interesting thing that were the categories, the people that were being voted on um, weren't necessarily the more visible criminals or uh, like uh, the, the, the people, the people that were being arrested and, and voted for with the kind of had lower level issues like failure to pay fines or fees or um, kind of more what you might consider petty things. Um, but if you did look at the general trend at the way the people looked, um, if uh, looking at a sample of 285 mugshots, um, 182 to 184, depending on what coder looked at it, um, saw that they were at what could be considered an attractive female or a, a, then second runner up um, was way farther down, um, but the kind of an alphabetical order, the, the main people that came up were disheveled females or disheveled males, somebody with a, a facial, uh, maybe a strange facial expression or somebody with a crazy hairstyle, someone with an injury, um, someone with a funny name or some type of other visual that was striking um, or had a, a, a pose that might be considered humorous. Um, or like these large face tattoos or some tattoo all over their body. There was a category of unknowns, um, but uh, basically for the most part, the, the, the most um, popular, I guess, or most visible person was the attractive female. So, um, so the conclusion was it's, you know, the site doesn't necessarily lead the audience to a careful analysis of the crime where possible subjects can be identified and then the more, more, most attractive arrestees were the ones that ended up being most visible. So my conclusion is um, with that online, online mugshots can be a form of digital vigilantism because these interactive platforms, you know, yeah, kind of call into being, they, they ask people to in, interact and uh, get people to target particular people for these weaponized, either being intense, unwanted and enduring visibility you know, a, a characteristic of digital vi vigilantism that Trottier talks about in uh, his article in 2017. So um, so if we're gonna consider that to be a digital, digital vigilantism, that this group of people can target individuals um, and kind of elevate their visibility to do harm to them, it does tend to have some implications. And one is that, you know, a mugshot viewer is typically viewed as somebody who um, kind of is a passive viewer that kind of watches at a distance. But being this, becoming a digital vigilante involves, you know, like actively participating or being involved. And as a viewer, um, you're not really, you know, elevating the status of someone, you're just kind of passively viewing it. But as a digital vigilante, you are able to weaponize vis visibility. The more likes that someone got, the more visible their, their photo became. It also raises questions of, um, you know, the motivations, though, of those that are being digital vigilantes, are they, uh, they're not necessarily justice seeking. In this case, um, there's more of an entertainment as exigency. People wanted to um, involve themselves maybe for fun. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, again, I wasn't able to, but, you know, there's a, a, a game version, a game um, basis for this exigency. And it also questions motive too, because um, to be a digital vigilante, do you have to, to come um, thinking that you're going to be shaming someone or, or is this kind of like a creep of the, the technology that you're using um, is, you know, it starts in the name of justice and more eyes on crime, but it ends up as an entertainment that um, disproportionately shames and, and uh, targets certain groups. Um, it also brings a public private connection, um, you know, a vigilante isn't necessarily um, is also oftentimes someone that exercise or does their work 
outside of law enforcement. So, and then there's also a private public connection. So, um, but those are the connections I came to. I, I thought this was overall an interesting case um, of uh, what could be considered digital vigilantism that uh, doesn't necessarily um, be motivated by the same, uh, I guess, exigency that other uh, spaces have been. Um, so anyway, thank you for listening. <laughs>I, I guess I, I, I guess when I think of uh, constitutive rhetoric, I think of, you know, in, in this case, like what is calling people um, into being? Like why are certain people like gravitating towards the language? Like what what is inciting them to join <laughs> to become a digital vigilante? I guess you could think of, um, and. And I, I think that they recognize people recognize themselves in the discourse and the language and the symbols of thinking like you know what this is this is something I want to engage in you know it, I guess I'm just thinking back at like when it's entertainment you know the people aren't necessarily engaging is to to be um, vigilantes they're hearing this call of uh, maybe participating in something I want to vote for these people but somehow they're also still engaging in it so they're they're seeing themselves and it, they be kind of call into I guess certain actions and, and words call into being a certain group of people to do certain um, acts. And I, I guess I'm just interested in how, like the rhetoric that calls people into being and, and what what it is that makes someone join instead of just passively sitting by. So I think that's one thing that my chapter left me, like why are we joining and how how are groups calling into being, or words and, and action, or words and, and posts and, and social media calling into being a group of people that may not have been together um, before um, to, to do certain things, so.